All right, so before we get officially started, I'm going to show you a video. Some of you, if you, if you normally read the blog, you might have already come across this, but if you're brand new to the world of roller derby outside of the WOTA, this will shock you in a good way, though. All right, buckle your seatbelts, everybody. Flat bottom, roller game. ロクジュビオカンの国の選手がかけ抜けて地上最速のバトルを見たことがあるか熱き思い今解き放て東京ゴンバーズ紫スポーツ決戦会場東京ドームローラースケートアリーナ因縁の対決が今始まる新しい歴史の始まりを目撃せよ Mmm, could watch that forever Oh my god, that was fun Yeah, I don't know Alright, so everybody You want some more of that? You want some more of that? I got, I got some more of that Where do you sign up for it? Yeah <laughs> All right, everybody, so uh, welcome to another Derby the Seminar. I'm Windy Man, as some of you may know. I'm the author of the uh, Roller Derby Notes blog on the old internet. Uh, I'm also an on-again, off-again skater. Uh, currently off-again, because uh, i got a giant volleyball growing out of my hip. Uh, I'll freak you out if you want to know about, more about that later. I also uh, do photography uh, for Sugartown Roller Girls. Where's the woo? Okay, woo! Yeah, thank you. Right. And, uh, woo. And uh, also uh, been uh, involved with roller derby, not involved, but a fan of roller derby for over 20 years. Uh, because I remember roller derby when I was like a five-year-old kid uh, on TV. And let me just duplicate this. They didn't have it on TV 20 years ago, did they? Uh, they did. And I'll explain. Uh, yes, in the 80s and the 90s and uh, every year in between. So yeah, I'll, I'll get to all that. I'll cover everything as far as <laughs> various eras of roller derby. So we're going to learn some new stuff here tonight. And the whole thing about Another Derby, what this project is, uh, it, it started off just as a series of blog posts on my blog, but it's actually kind of turning into something a little bit bigger. Uh, when I talk to people about roller derby, you know, everybody is old eagle, learn about the rules and strategies and, and everything like that. But the more people I talk to, the more I just get the sense that they don't quite understand the game. And what I mean by that is the whole history of it, why things are the way they are, you know, why roller derby the way it is, basically. So what this is going to do is that we're going to show a bunch of videos from different eras of the game, the old derby. And then I'm going to point out, okay, this is why this is the way it was. Like, this is why there's a pack. This is where the pivot came from. This is why power jams suck and why we can make them better and how and stuff like that. And uh, then I'm going to compare those and contrast those to modern roller derby and say, okay, this is the modern rule set that has this concept, and this is the one that has this concept. And in doing that, we can find the things that roller derby has in common across all eras, whether it was you know, real or fake or staged or legit or anything like that. And then we can go, hey, that makes sense. And then we can apply it to the modern game in the future and try to make it better for everybody as we go. And also make it more awesome. Because roller derby is awesome, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. One person thinks it's awesome. I think it's marvelous. OK. So let's start at the beginning. Where else to start? 1940s, 1950s. Leo Seltzer, the inventor of roller derby himself. There's Leo. Now, uh, 1920s, 1930s or so, Leo was a promoter. Uh, he did stuff called walkathons. They were, uh, you know, think the pants off dance off, but everybody was wearing pants, and they didn't stop for four weeks. The winners of these contests were literally the last ones standing. If you dropped, you were out, like dropped, and you were gone. And if you could survive, basically, you won. And that's what, that's what passed for entertainment during the Great Depression. <laughs> and he was actually doing pretty well with these walkathon things. But uh, one day in the mid-30s, he had an idea. Hey, everybody roller skates. Everybody knows roller skating. Everybody's done roller skating before. Why didn't I add roller skating to this little thing? So he did. Uh, August 13th, 1935, he put on his little, little roller skating event, which he called the Transcontinental Roller Derby. That's uh, 78 years ago this month in Chicago. That's, that's Genesis right there. Look at all those people. 
crazy amount of, I can't shadow, uh, yes, okay, cool. Now, the original roller derby was way different than we know it. I mean, obviously everybody's on skates, they go around in circles, but uh, how it worked back then, uh, there were male-female pairs, uh, teams of two, one guy, one girl. Uh, they would try to race to cover uh, a distance, in this case, 3,000 miles. It was transcontinental because it simulated going from like, you know, LA to New York or something. It was cross-country, simulated race. It took them about four weeks, it's going to get about 100 miles a day in if they were good. You know, eight hours a day, 100 miles. You know, that's a little bit more than 27 in, in five. <laughs> Just a little bit. And as you can see, as you can see, it was really popular. But one of the more popular parts of the event were they would occasionally have like little sprint competitions where uh, the players would try to lap each other for bonuses. And yeah, that sounds a little bit familiar because it does. Leo noticed that those parts, you know, everybody skating in circles, fine, but everybody racing in circles, yes, we want that. So Leo took that, he kind of developed it out, and in a couple of years, like 37, 38 or so, he eventually developed it into the five-on-five -five team game we would recognize today as roller derby. So let's jump into it. I'm going to show you the first video here of what roller derby looked like. Once again, it's the roller derby coming to you from the Philadelphia Arena in Philadelphia. We're about to go into the seventh period of tonight's skating with a score. New York 10, Philadelphia 8, and the action on the track here. Number 23, Mary Lou Palermo on a move on this one, and Murray blocks back four. Mary Lou pulling away, but here comes the big gal, Kay Bourbon, number 37 of the Philadelphia team, moving after. Murray and Johnstone also up in there, and Murray blocks Johnstone, and Palermo holds the lead down. Here comes Murray in the picture. And Fred is working on Johnstone. Beautiful blocking by Gloria Fred in front of that pack. Two against one, Bourbon in a tight spot now. Bourbon in the middle of the two New York players. Murray on the left, Palermo in the lead. There's Brent blocking on his back in the front of the pack. Johnstone, number 35, tries to come on it. Brent is after and blocks her up. Two against one on this jam. New York has the edge. Arbo, Murray, K. Verba. All up in there. A foul is called. Betty Joe Harris, illegal use of her hands. Philadelphia player off the track. Using her hands illegally. Down goes Verba. Two New York players are off loose. Verba down, getting up. The minute down and one to go on this jam now. The two top Philadelphia uh, New York players move in. Murray the captain and Murray's number one gal, Murray Lou Palermo. Here they come rolling in there. A good chance to score, a lot of points here. It all depends on the defense of Philadelphia. The two big gals back there, good blockers. Key Verba, number 37. The blonde pulley from Philly, the captain, Bobby Johnstone. Looking over his shoulder now. Johnstone and Verba on the defense. Here comes Palermo. Here comes Murray. Moving in there. Up to 35 seconds to go. They're moving in. Verba blocks up one, blocks back the other. Verba's doing it all himself. Doing a slow job. Verba stopping up both of them, but now Palermo scores over. Right, I know how to do it back then. So that's uh, that's roller derby in 1949, actually, uh, between Gotham and Philly. If you can believe that. <laughs> so uh, uh, here are the rules from 1949. There, there was a lot of differences. I'm only going to show you the, the key points here. Uh, but back then, games were eight periods. Uh, that's because, like in the original roller derby, men and women were on the same team. So you had uh, alternating men, women, men, women throughout the game, and combined score wins because they were the same team. Uh, jams back then were two minutes. You saw pretty much a full jam. Uh, scoring system, I have no idea what's happening here. One point for one or two people, two points for three or four people. You should look at five for passing them all, <laughs> but I, I don't know. And uh, here, we're going to go over this a little bit later, but the jam, end when, uh, the jam ends when, obviously, hands on hips. Uh, but if the jam, lead jammer falls or leaves the track, that's instantly the end of the jam. And uh, that's important for a concept player. But I want to focus up here. There was no initial pass. And more importantly, all players were eligible to score. Which means, yes, everyone is a jammer. Wow. <laughs> That's why you saw two people go out. So imagine if both Susie Hot Rod and Bonnie Thunders could go out to jam at the same time. 
Oh my goodness. Yes. But there is a method to this madness. Now, of course, since anybody could go out to score, all somebody had to do was skate away from the front, lap around, and pass from behind, you know, which is kind of like roller derby. But how uh, Leo Seltzer's original version of the game worked was that teams needed to figure out the best strategy to send players out to jam on offense while simultaneously preventing the other team from doing the same thing, or that is, play defense. So if you want to send somebody out by themselves, you got to block everybody. Obviously, offense, defense, that's, mm -hmm. that's roller derby, right? Mm -hmm. Play offense and defense at the same time. So if you want to play you know, one jammer on offense, you got to do moderate amount of blocking, like four on five. But if you want to do a lot of offense, you got to do a lot of defense. So let's say you want to send out two by themselves. Well, you got to hold back five with three. So you see, the more offense you do, the less defense you have to do it with. See how that works? But you might notice something here. This, this idea that when you have a team at the front playing defense, so it can go out to play offense. Well, there's a term for this, and it's called the pack. See, this is the idea of the pack. It's not something that was actually defined. It's a naturally occurring phenomenon in roller derby. Because a, without a pack, the jammers would never be able to lap around and score. They'd just be skating in circles forever. So, because it was actually in the best interests of a team to make a pack and play defense so they can go out to score offense. So, what this means in the context of the game is that if you have a jammer out and you want to make sure you score as many points as you can, you want to make as much defense happen as possible by being in front of the other team to play defense. But conversely, this means if you're not able to hold back the other team, if you don't play any defense at all, you get squat. Zero, nothing, nada. They just go because they're allowed to do so. Which is a short contrast to kind of what everybody's used to right now, where if they get by you, well, they can't really go more than 10 feet away, and they can't really play defense because this isn't happening. So the concept of, you know, you need to play defense to play offense, this still exists today in various forms. I mean, obviously, you hold back the jammer, and that's defense. Your jammer can go out to play offense. But there's a little more to that. And uh, the one rule set today that really kind of stays true to this is USARs. Now, USARs is relatively new to roller derby as far as them having a rule set and actually pr diverting proper resources to making it roller derby. But obviously they've been around forever since the 30s. They only added roller derby 2011. Uh, they only really had their first year of people playing by the rule set last year. And at the moment they got about, uh, about 20 or so leagues playing USARs, including of course, you know, the 20 2009 champs, the only rollers. They're switching to USARs, or they maybe not, don't know. So that'll get figured out as we go forward. But anyways, let me show you a couple of rules differences with USARs. So uh, they have shorter jams, 90 seconds. The lead jammer can switch. So it's not a locked-in thing. If you get passed while you're lead jammer, then the other person gets lead. So it's like whoever's winning the jammer race is the lead jammer. And in fact, that applies to pretty much every version of roller derby I'm going to show you here in a minute. The pivot. The pivot is eligible to score after lead status has been established. And I'll get to that in the next section, but that's a pretty significant gameplay change. But uh, so is this. I want to focus here. Pack definition. The team in the front is the pack, which is exactly almost kind of how the Leo Seltzer version of roller derby works. Or that if you can get by everybody, you can either slow down everybody or speed up everybody to play offense or defense as required. And I'll show you a USARS jam here so you can get an idea of exactly how this works. All right, so start of a jam in USARS, you'll notice right away how there's all this space in front of the jammers. Well, they forced that on the, on the start. But you see, you know, jammers, blockers, and everybody goes. And I'll explain why that is in, a, in the next section. But we want to focus there on the black jammer going to take a nice whip out, lead jammer. Okay, now everybody start focusing on the black blockers. We need them to play defense so their jammer can play offense. So as all the green players start pushing forward to try to help their jammer, or their pivot in this case, 
break out, you're going to start noticing how the green team propagates toward the front of the pack. Okay, and especially around this next corner right here. One, two, three, four, five. Black team, where's the defense? They didn't keep anybody behind them. So appropriately, they lose control of the pack. And as the black jammer comes back around and try to score, no defense. Where's the defense? Has no choice, got to call it off because no defense. So they don't get any offense. Pretty easy concept. <laughs> and here it is in a diagram. So, red team, got to play defense. They didn't, so the blue team's the pack. Whoosh, there they go. And you notice, in this situation, even though the red jammer's the lead jammer, the blue jammer is actually in better scoring position because now that red team, they drop too far back, they're out of play. And that's easy pickings for the blue jammer, which is why the red jammer had to call it off early, defensively, basically. And that's kind of the key in this situation, the whole thing about the pack. Yeah, lead jammer is important, but it's only half the story. You got to be taking care of business in the pack to take full advantage of that lead, ja lead jammer position. Otherwise, you're not going to do anything. It's a team game, right? You know, pack's got to do well, jammer's got to do well. Both happen, you score points. One or the other doesn't happen, then it's kind of close. And if neither happens, it gets jack shit. Simple, right? You guys getting it? Yeah. Cool. All right, so that's what USARS is doing. And uh, they've got a challenge out going on tomorrow at noon, I think. So I'm going to be there. Recommend you guys check it out, especially if you've never seen anything other than what we know. OK, that's that. Next thing. I mentioned that USARS, the pivots, they can go out to score as if they were a jammer. And that's the thing about pivots. I mean, why is there even a pivot in roller derby? What's, what's the deal with pivots? There's some pivots. And in fact, you can see, you've got the star panning on. This is like a you know, star pass in progress. But about that, well, what, why a star pass? Where did, where did that come from? What's the thing about a pivot sometimes, but not always being able to become a jammer? And in fact, what's the deal with a pivot in the first place? Why does the position even exist? What's its role? What's its function? What's its purpose? So to figure this out, we've got to go back to where the pivot was first invented and developed and all that. And that, we're going to turn to Mr. Jerry Seltzer in the 60s and 1970s, specifically the early 1970s. There's the roller derby Jesus himself, Jerry Seltzer. <laughs> By the way, you know why he's called the roller derby Jesus? He's the son of the father of roller derby. <laughs> I inadvertently gave him that nickname, by the way. <laughs> Ironically, he's Jewish. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, 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 yeah, okay. So, Jerry Seltzer. This is something that most people don't know. I mean, roller derby, obviously, 30s to 70s and beyond, it lasted a long time. But when Jerry took over the family business, derby wasn't actually doing that well. Leo kind of had to run around the country, chase around the country, just to find enough money to keep roller derby going. Because you have to remember, you know, like today, it's all volunteer run, and that's great. But back then, you had to pay everybody. You had to pay the arenas, you got to pay the track workers, you got to pay the skaters, you got to, you know, tickets, you got to, you know, make sure you get enough of that. So, the, the, believe it or not, Leo was this close, at least two or three times, just pulling the plug and stopping it and ending roller derby in like the 40s and in the early 50s. I mean, it was really close a couple of times. And if he had done that, we probably wouldn't even be here talking about it. But, you know, he was really loyal to his game. He was really loyal to his players. He just found ways to make it work. And he eventually did. And when Jerry came in, he kind of had to be realistic about Derby's financial realities, I guess you could say. He, because you saw that, that early video, it was like 10 to 8 after six periods. Think about that. <laughs> I mean, defense is fine, but not that much defense. you got to <laughs> score some points. So what Jerry did is he changed the rules up to kind of make it more, well, faster, faster pace of the game, a little more action-packed. And uh, what he also did is he developed the, suppose, I guess, the game we all know right now as far as having different positions. So he changed it so instead of having five jammers on a team, now he brought it down to two jammers on a team. And he also added the blocker position, which was just the you know, non-scoring player that was in the pack. 
But the fifth player he added was the pivot. Well, he called it the pivot man back there. You see the guys in the black helmets there on the left? Even though they're on different teams, if you wore a black helmet, you were a pivot. And the jammers back then were a cross stripe helmet. So there was no star. But still, he did designate the pivot as far as them being a different position altogether from everybody else. What this did to the game is that it did make it a lot faster, but it didn't change it that much from Leo's original version. And I'll show you, I'll explain what the pivot does here, but first I want to show you a video from 1970. This is when roller derby was pretty much at its peak in America. Pretty popular at the time, as you will see. And keep your eyes open for the black helmets, because it, it's obvious that they're the pivot, and you're going to see how, what they're doing, and then I'll explain it all here in a minute. New record in the tennis and roller derby games here tonight. The Bombers had to go outdoors to do it. That's the only way you can get this many people in to see a game. 28,804 teams beating the record set in March of 1970 at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Tony Roman on the jam. Here's a whip from Woodbury to Robinson. Too much on the whip from Johnny Roman leading on the jam. Bombers could wage a defensive battle here. Have a good lead. 13 points. Robinson whipped again. Tony Roman with a good lead on him, though. He'll make Robinson work, though. He won't cut off the camera. Robinson gets up there. Robinson is in the draw here. Roar. Roman has caught the back. Giller off to the block for him. Moving on, Big Bob Woodbury. He pulls him around. Woodbury still up there. Gets up there. One point. Orozco and Roman teaming up. Walt Harris back to trackside, the Oakland Coliseum Stadium, the big triple-deck stadium here, so that they can get all the 28,000, almost 29,000 fans in to see this game. The Bombers in the brazen, the Bombers definitely in trouble now. The Bombers lead by six, 40 to 34. They've got to get those jammers out of there first. They're outweighed, they're outgunned out there right now with Charlie out of the game. Braves have some huge men out there, the Bombers much smaller in size. Butler wearing the pivot helmet for the Bombers, put by the 30, on the outside. There's Robinson getting out of there. And Alan Littles. Smith is out of there. Butler breaking away. Smith. Here's a whip of Smith to Butler. He can hold it, hold it, hold it. Yes, he did. Hold it. Robinson hits him into the rail. He stays on his skates, though. Butler coming back. That's that too. Robinson breaks through. Come back. Here's the referee see. Wild action. Bombers are going to go. Let's see. Cliff Butler in the pivot helmet, 36. Tony Roman is going to jam again with Larry Smith. But the Braves is going to be Darnie McCormick. Adam Williams, 24. And Ronnie Robinson again. And he's in charge now. Robinson and Woodbury out. The Braves are in charge. Minute 15 to go in the game. The Bombers can't do anything about this now but go on the defense. They have no one out to score. They have no one out who can cut off the jam. Strictly defense by the Bombers. The Bombers in trouble here. Robinson putting something out to Woodbury. They're moving up. Cliff Butler back to the block. 36. Yellow lost to 39. Cliff Butler doing a yeoman job out there in place of Charlie O'Connell. They're moving behind him. The Bombers with a full away. And the crowd goes wild because Runaway Pussy is boring. Oh wait, no it wasn't. Hmm, I wonder why that is. <laughs> right. right. Let's get back to where I was here. So that's, uh, that was 1970, uh, July 4th, 1970 actually. Jerry put on uh, July 4th games every year outdoors. They're obviously hugely popular and really awesome. <laughs> all right, so now we're into the 1970s. Let's uh, look at a couple of the rules there. Uh, not all of them, of course. Uh, still eight periods, but they're a little bit shorter. Still men and women on the same team. Jams were 60 seconds, but there was a little quirk in that, in that the jam didn't actually officially start until after the initial pass. <laughs> That's because it was, you know, they were always skating around. Like it was, you know, the play was always going on. The jam didn't start until somebody actually broke out which is kind of how it was back in the original roller derby with the you know, bonus sprints. Every jam 
a uh, team was required to field one position player from each position. So they had to have at least a jammer, they had to have at least their pivot, and they had to have at least their blocker. That was the minimum. They had to have one of each, or there was no such thing as a power jam back then. But here, we're talking about the pivots. The pivots were eligible to break and score but only after the lead jammer has been established. What this means is that once the jammer, once somebody in one of the teams gets out for lead and the jam starts effectively, all the pivot has to do is go and they can be a jammer. That's what the pivot position was originally designed to do. And this is why. At the start of every jam, there was a rolling pack start. There was no start line except at the beginning of a period. The pivots start there at the front. And really, that's the place you want to be if you're a pivot because you have to act as both a last line of defense or you have to act as kind of like a plan B jammer. So if the blue team gets out for lead and the red jammers are way stuck back in the pack, well, as a pivot, you're kind of already at the front of the pack to begin with, so you can just go to make sure you have a scoring chance on the play and also keep the lead jammer honest as far as making sure they don't overdo it when they go in the scoring pass. But, you know, that seems like an awful powerful thing to do, that you can just send a pivot out. I mean, why even send out a jammer? But, like any fair game, this can be countered with the other pivot. They both start up there. So they might be called upon to play offense, but more importantly, they need to play defense. So if roller derby is a game where you have to play offense and defense at the same time, the pivot is the position that you have to play offense and defense at the same time. It's because the blockers are your defense, the jammers are your offense, the pivot is both. So really, the pivot has got to be your best player almost, because they might have to do it all on a jam. So, this is really like Leo's, Leo Seltzel's original version of roller derby in that if everybody can go, they go from the front. Well, the pivot sort of balances out the fact that the jammers start at the back of the pack. And I'll show you what I mean by that because besides USARs who have that pivot rule, there's another modern roller derby rule set that has it, which is MADE, Modern Athletic Derby Endeavor. Now, a lot of people probably haven't heard of MADE. They're based on the East Coast mostly. They have about a, just about 1,000 players registered in the system. And uh, their rule set's probably the most direct descendant of the original 70s roller derby rules. Here's some quick points about the made rules. They actually have some really neat things going on here. They play banked and flat track, same rule set. They play four periods, or they also play eight periods because they can also mix the teams up like they used to. Uh, I like this one. There's an enforced mandatory minimum skating speed. If the refs think you're going too slow, they're going to whistle you and make you skate. Which I, yes, <laughs> we love that. Uh, yeah, uh, interesting pack definition and pack bridging. There is no bridging. It's just 20 feet. That's it. It's like the range game and the price is right. That's your pack and it doesn't move. <laughs> but my favorite, that one. You cut somebody, you just pull up. I uh, cut somebody, wait for them to pass by you and you're back in the play. No penalties. It's really hard to get a cutting penalty made. Because this is important, if, because everybody's skating, if you cut somebody, you just slow down, they'll pass right by you and just get back in it like you never cut them. There's no impact, so there's no penalty, right? I wonder why everybody doesn't do that. So I'm going to show you a video from a made rules game. I'm just going to focus on the initial pass, and we're going to see how the pivot changes the strategy on the initial pass and what is required of a team to both defend and offhand against it, I guess you could say. All right, so beginning of the jam, there are our pivots right there at the front. Well, that's where we like them. That's where they want to be. They want to be there in case they need to defend or offhand. And plus, you want to make sure the blockers don't suck them back into the pack, because if you're at the back as a pivot, you're, you're no good to anybody but a blocker. So you're going to see at the start of the jam, we're just going to straight out, make sure they claim the front and do their thing up there. There they come. So let's watch the blue jammer. All right, here comes the blue jammer. Really, whoa, what happened there? He stopped. Huh, why did he do that? Well, there's two things going on here. 
Here's our black pivot. As we know, once this guy goes out for lead, this guy can become a jammer. He knows that. And he doesn't want somebody from the other team chasing him out right off the bat if he can help it, which is why he stopped. Because the minute he passes him, he can, he's a jammer and he can pass him back and lead status switches. So you can have a lead pivot. He doesn't want that. Blue team doesn't want that. So you see him sticking his arm out. He's saying, hey, everybody, get that guy. And they'll be able to do this because here in the back, we got one blue blocker holding back the black jammer all by himself. And you notice this is easier to do because the pack is moving. Defense is easier to play when everybody's moving. That's an important tip. Because the jammer's taken care of, all the other blockers are suddenly free. All these resources are free to go play offense to block that guy. That's the enemy right now. We want to stop him. So here comes the offense. Took him out. Now this guy knows, okay, he's taken care of. I can go out to jam. No one's gonna bug me. We can start off the points. There he goes. And as you'll see, the blue team has a bit of a presence at the front of the pack. And this video is very good after that. But that's what I wanted to show you is the initial pass. You gotta be at the front of the pack to hold everybody back. That includes now pivots. That's the reason why the pivots are there, is to kind of restore how everybody kind of skated away at the beginning. Wh whoever is controlling the front of the pack controls the pack effectively. And the pivot game is kind of what adds like a really lot of strategy stuff to it. Because it's not just, well, everybody wall up on the jammer and we're winning. No, 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 no. That's not exactly how it works. And I'll show you a little diagram of that. Here. Now, if we play defense the way everybody thinks we're supposed to play defense, the red team got the jammer in the back. Good job, except you kind of ignored the other four people on the blue team, which isn't good, because even if the red jammer gets out of that wall and can go play offense, well, because the red team played poor team defense against the other team, blue pivot totally free to chase. And the best the red team could hope for is maybe a point as he comes back around to lap the jammer in the pack. And if he's too greedy, that blue pivot might even come around and pass all four of those blockers in the back and get all four points. So that's the, that's the balance that, okay, you can put all that defense in the back, but those defenders also can become points if they're that far back. So you don't want that. You don't want that. What you want is this. If the red team wants to go out unopposed, you got to play defense in the back against the jammer, defense in the front against the pivot, and defense against all those other blockers trying to play offense to free either of their scoring players. So this, it, it, this, this idea is that you're playing a team sport. So the team is everybody working together. The sport is everybody playing against each other. This is the difference between playing defense against just the jammer and playing defense against everybody. And this is really important because the flip side to this is that if you don't play defense against anybody, <sighs> mm. right. This is kind of an important fact because roller derby historically was a game always designed for both teams to have a scoring opportunity, a scoring threat. Either everybody's a jammer, or two jammers in a pivot, or one jammer in a pivot. But you got to have somebody on the track to play offense. Otherwise, you know, that happens and nobody plays defense against it. But we're going to go a little bit further with the idea of what it means to play defense against the team. Because there's more to it than just, well, stop the jammer, or stop the pivot, or do this or that. Because if you try to retrofit one jammer gameplay, into a game designed for two jammers, this happens, and we don't want this. This has been a sticking point in roller derby for a couple of years now. How do we deal with this power jam problem? How do we deal with passive offense? How do we do this and how do we do that? Well, newsflash, everybody. This problem has been solved for a really long time. 20 years ago, somebody figured it out. 
And they didn't figure it out here. They figured it out in Japan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you laugh. Now, what's... <laughs> I love the Japanese. But what's been happening in Japan the last couple of years is really interesting. I mean, really interesting. When I found out about this, I was like, wow! <laughs> By the way, isn't that an awesome photo? In the uh, 60s and 70s, like, roller derby was getting really good in America, so it was also getting big internationally. And uh, one of the places where it got big, of all places, is Japan. Their team, the Tokyo Bombers, no relation to the Bay Bombers. Yeah, and, yeah. He, right, exactly. They, they, they were young, they were pretty good, and one of their key uh, star players was this guy, Hiroshi Koizumi. Well, I shouldn't call him a guy, he's a kid, because he started skating with the Bombers when he was 15 years old. Now, let's think about this. Bank track, a little rougher back then, no juniors leagues, and he was 15, and he was out there with them. So, this guy had it. He was pretty good. And, like, roller derby in Japan was actually pretty, doing pretty good compared to how it was in America. But uh, even through the mid-80s, it was starting to kind of get into a little bit of a crisis situation, again, over money, especially in Japan with the real estate going through the roof, population explosion. So it was kind of hard to keep a bank track going. What Hiroshi did, at this time he was like a, like a, a rink owner and a promoter, so he's like Jerry Seltzer, except he skated, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. He said, hey, you know what, we need to save roller derby, we need to keep roller derby going, but we can't really do this on a bank track anymore. Hey, why don't we do it in my roller rink on the flat track? Yes, everybody, the Japanese invented flat track roller derby in 1988. And if you'll notice a couple of other things too, you'll see they also did co-ed derby for the first time. There in the upper left, that's a lady jammer in the motocross helmet. And what's that? Inline skates in my roller derby. What? I'm seeing some agape mouse in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He didn't care. By the way, there he is right there, skating. <laughs> he was totally inclusive. He like, you know, you got it, let's do it, let's come. This thing took off pretty good. And if you saw that first clip, that's what this is. <laughs> and it got really popular really fast. So popular, in fact, he had started a league in the mid, like early 90s, 1990, 1991. It got so popular, he was able to get enough money to actually bring back the bank track for a special series of games against Team USA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you think you know roller derby history, huh? Mm -mm -mm. No, sir. USA versus Japan in um, May 1993, and they also did one the next year. Where were they from, though? What, Team USA? USA. All over. They were just any of the uh, you know professional derby skaters that were still around in the early 90s. Oh. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So I have some clips from this event. If you have seat belts, I recommend you buckle them. And also you'll discover the reason why they wear motocross helmets for jammers. <laughs>
Now you think that was nuts. I'm going to blow your minds oh. with this next stat. All right, you probably didn't notice this, but all of those jams were power jams. And in fact, in this game, every jam is a power jam. I know, right? <laughs> How is that possible? Well, I'll tell you, we'll look at some of the rules. Now, this game is very, very, very different than the rule we right now. So I can't fit all the possible rules differences. But here's an interesting one. There is no period clock, because they don't actually play periods. They play sets. It's actually like tennis. Uh, what happens is that the teams alternate playing offense on power jams. So team A, offense, team B, defense, and then team B, offense, team A, defense. They alternate 60-second jam. And uh, how it works is that each team gets three offensive jams in a set, three defensive jams. And whoever gets the most points in that set of six jams wins the set, points reset, then they play the next set. And whoever gets three sets out of five wins. So it's tennis, but it's roller derby. <laughs> and it's also full contact. Arm contact, leg blocks, knee blocks, jump blocks. They're cool. That's why they're all wearing hockey padding and the helmet. <laughs> Again, no initial pass. Once you pass somebody, you get a point. But I want to focus on two things here. First of all, there is no defined pack. All players are in play everywhere. There is no such thing as out of play. In fact, even if you are touching, in, uh, touching out of bounds, you're still in bounds as long as you're touching in bounds. So you've got to be completely out of bounds to be out of bounds, which is important because just like Leo Silter's roller derby, we have a lot of ways the jam can end. It's not just hands on hip. It's not just 60 seconds. If the jammer goes completely out of bounds, the jam is instantly over. If the jammer is stopped on the track for a couple of seconds, the jam is instantly over. If the defense all repasses the jammer, the jam is instantly over. So there's actually more ways for the defense to end a jam than the offense. And there's a very, very important reason why this is. Here's the start of a jam. They actually line them up in a certain way. All, all the uh, defense is on the inside and all the offense is on the outside, kind of in like a split vertical start box like that. And the jammer comes in from the infield in the flat track version, and the jam starts. Now, because there's no defined pack, the red team, they don't want to get score on, so they're just going to go, at least the players in the front. And uh, as we've learned, if you want to make a pack, if you want to play offense, you've got to defend against the fact that those red players can go. So it's in the best interest of the blue team to get in front as many of the red players as they can so they can kind of make a little bit of a pack. The red player can come back around all he wants, but it's actually legal for the players to stop on the track. So what often happens is that if players get too far ahead, they'll stop and they'll just wait for everybody to come back around, because that jammer's coming around no matter what happens. But the fact that the jam ends when a jammer goes out of bounds creates a very significant consequence for the offense if they don't help their jammer. Because if you don't help your jammer, he goes out of bounds, that's it. End of the jam, however many points you've gotten, you get those points. But if he comes into the track and that first blocker hits him out, that's it, nothing. This consequence, there's actually two consequences. If these blockers can't keep the defense you know, in a pack, they don't score very many points. And you see, if that red player comes back around like that, I mean, yeah, you'll still be able to engage him. The jammer will eventually pass him, but it's that much more time wasted to try to get back around to him. So it's kind of a time pressure thing, too, is that we don't have much time. We've got to hold these guys back. We've got to hold them back. But really, this one, too, you've got to help your jammer. If you just leave him alone, that's bad. So you really got to whip a system. You've got to try to blast them through with blockers before they have a chance to react. That's why they were going so freaking fast, because everybody's rolling to begin with. But that's what whips do. They accelerate you by somebody. If you can't go any faster, a whip will always put you past your top speed. And that's kind of the idea of a whip. Now, the idea of consequence, there's a modern roller derby rule set that kind of sort of takes both of these concepts and, I'm not going to say runs with them, but incorporates into the game in a way that kind of makes sense for the modern game. And that's these guys, Roller Derby Coalition of Leagues, also known as Bank Track. Roller Derby. Any bank track, of which are like, I guess there are 15 or 20 or something like that. 
Any bank track west of the Mississippi has basically plays by these rule sets, the Roller Coalition of Leagues. And here are some of the finer points. Play four quarters, still 60 minute games, 60 second jams, and those start in the start whistle. So they've got the shortest jams in roller derby. This one, lead jammer must be on the track to call off the jam. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. The penalties are interesting. They call them while the jam happens, but they stay on the track. They only serve the penalty between jams, like before the next jam. And all penalties are one jam in length. There are no time penalties. It's just one jam and you're off the track. And then when jam over, you come back on. But uh, here, this one I want to talk about too. They don't have any destruction of pack penalties. Now, they're still a pack, and they're still required to reform the pack. But what this does is it creates a consequence for a team on offense. Let's say if, I don't know, they're on the power jam, hmm, like the Japanese did when all those skaters were running around in circles. Hmm. I'm going to show you a, a jam from a bank track game. In fact, this is when uh, Rose City came down to L.A. to play on the bank track. One of the perks of living in L.A. is that you get to see all the WIFTA teams come down and play on the bank track. It's kind of awesome. And you should get a, like, so think power jam in your head. You're going to see a big difference, and it's just a little change that they made. We also have penalties, liquor and split with an arms penalty, joined by uh, Much Mayhem with a stop blocking penalty, and French Tickler with a back blocking major penalty. And French Tickler was the jammer in that jam, so Wheels of Justice will not have a jammer in this jam. And it's going to be a... Power jam! Yeah! Whoa! Power jam being led by Charge and Tina. Already threw the pack on her initial pass. Bald Eagle and Havana, good time. The defense out front for the Wheels of Justice. They're doing everything they can to contain Chargentina. LA coming up to break up that wall. It's the Wheels of Justice wall captains out there, exactly, working well together. Sargentina shrugging off a hit from Havana, good time. And she's only got five seconds left on the clock. Pretty good penalty kill there by Rose City, only giving up five points on that power jam. So you should have seen right away the big difference. I mean, they almost got through three laps, the blockers did, in 60 seconds. And in uh, other rule sets, you might get three feet. So here's what's going on here. Also, I want to note that in uh, bank track rules, uh, you're required to skate forward at all times, so there's no backwards recycling. But that's irrelevant here, because what's happening is that uh, the start of a jam, red team's on the power jam, red team gets lead jammer. However, because the red team didn't play defense, now that blue team's at the front. Now, the blue team, that doesn't make them the front of the pack like in new stars. But what it does do, because there's no destruction of pack, they can just skate on forward a little bit. They got about two or three seconds before they have to kind of do their bit to reform the pack, so they kind of like slow up a little bit while the red team comes forward. But this puts the blue team in the same position, so they're just going to go forward again. Uh, so the red team's got to go forward again. Hey, wait a second. I've seen this before. Because the red team did not play defense, they don't get to play offense, and likely you're going to see a very low-scoring power jam. Uh, the only reason why uh, LA there got five points is because Rose City had like, two blockers. If they had four blockers, they weren't going to get anything. So LA was not going to get any points. You, you see what's happening here. The only way this situation, it's, it's bad for the red team because it's their own fault. They let everybody buy. What the, what the, uh, the red team's going to have to do is that they're going to have to goat somebody or preferably, they're going to have to come up with the right strategy to prevent them, everybody from getting by in the first place. And this is why also the lead jammer is not able to call it off if they go out of bounds. And in fact, USARS and MADE and all the old forms of roller derby, it was this way too. If you don't help your jammer and they get shoved out, well, 
that's bad for your team because the defense made a good play, so they should be rewarded with that with a chance for their jammer to come back around, steal lead status by the pass of it, and pick up some points. So if you lock in lead jammer, even if you make a, bi like a big mistake, you're never really punished for it because there's no consequence, which is why you don't see people going up to help their jammer because they know, well, if they go out of bounds, well, we're still defending in the back and this and that. But no, you can't do that because like you saw in the Japanese roller derby there, if you leave your jammer alone, he will die. <laughs> Literally die. Be killed. Be murdered. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so even, even though that was all full contact and battle armor, battle roller, whatever you like to call it, I mean, the same concept applies here. You got to help your jammer. You just got to. Like, you, you don't leave your running back alone in football. You got to help him. Help him get through the other team. All right, so we're going to change gears here. I jumped the gun a little bit. <laughs> so as we all know, it's, it's no secret, historically, roller derby hasn't always been played professionally, <laughs> even though it was professional. And what, what, it was like, you know, in a way, pro wrestling. Uh, I mean, some jams were, were scripted. Some outcomes were predetermined. And there was kind of manipulation with minor things like storylines happening behind the scenes. And like I said, this is no secret. But there are some aspects of old roller derby that are kind of misunderstood. And when I talk to people, or what people only know, is they just kind of paint old roller derby with the same brushstroke. Oh, it was all fake. Well, some of it was faker than others. Now, what people don't realize is that roller derby, Jerry Seltzer's roller derby, I should say, shut down in 1973. So any roller derby from 1974 on, he had nothing to do with. Because the roller derby that existed in the dark ages, we'll call it, were these guys, roller games. <laughs> Some of you are laughing because I think, I, think, I think you guys know what's coming. But yeah, roller games, because History repeats itself. In 1960, there was a split. When Jerry Seltzer took over roller derby, there was a new separate promotion basically created from roller derby called Roller Games. And one of the teams that come out of Roller Games was the LA Thunderbirds, which some of you might have heard of. They're a pretty well-known team historically. And uh, by the way, Take note of that guy. That's Ralph Valadares. We'll see him again in a minute. 1961. Keep that in mind. So the thing about roller games is that it differentiated itself from Seltzer's roller derby in a, well, in a way that made it really popular really quick. Now, it was called Roller Games International because it was actually international. They had established or partnered with existing leagues in the US, of course, uh, like Canada, Mexico, Australia, and yes, Japan, which is what eventually led to that little roller game offshoot that they played. This is what seeded roller derby there originally. And it was so popular, this most attended game in roller derby history technically wasn't roller derby. It was an interleague game between roller derby and roller games. Not many people realize that, but this was a Comiskey Park in Chica uh, Chicago, of all places. 50,000, 118. 50,000 people to watch roller derby. And I, I, love, I love when you guys say wow like that. That's awesome. However, do I have a picture here? No, I don't. <laughs> However, when roller derby kind of shut down, or as it was in the process of shutting down, what Roller Games did is that if Roller Derby was sports entertainment, Jerry Seltzer was more sports. He tried to really keep it, you know, at least appear legitimate. So there wasn't really much fakery. Even when they did fight, it's kind of like in a hockey fight, because a lot of Roller Derby players hated each other. <laughs> they really didn't like each other. So sometimes there were genuine fisticuffs. But Roller Games, they went to the entertainment side. Oh, boy, did they go to the entertainment side. <laughs> uh, 
any roller you're gonna be like in, like late 70s, 80s, and even in the 90s, it was this crap. But in the 90s, in the early 80s, like the late 80s, early 90s, a TV producer uh, named David Sams, he, pretty high powerful, powerful TV producer, he did, uh, he put uh, Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, and Oprah into syndication. So the, he, this was the guy, basically, in TV in the 90s, early 90s. And one day he had an idea for a TV show. Hey, let's do a roller derby TV show. And he couldn't just hire any slums off you know, from the street. He needed people that knew how to skate for, the, for this to make work. So, by the way, that's Ralphie Valadares in the 80s, 20, 25 years on. Well, this guy's still going. So what David Sams did, it defies explanation. You, I'm just going to show you this, and you're going you're, you're, you're gonna to have to pick up your jaw off the floor after this. Right, right, right. Oh my god, it's just the most awful, amazing thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you have no idea what you're in for. Hello everyone, with David Sams, Chuck Underwood from the Super Roller Dome where the skaters of Roller Games International are chomping at the bit for a shot at this brand new concept in a track. Just wait till you see these skaters take on the 14 foot high wall of death. It could be devastating. In the sky jump, and yes, the live alligator pit used during sudden death overtime. Chuck, that could be devastating. Well, as witnessed about an hour ago, when the best laid plans of alligators and men went awry. Chuck, can you believe it? I mean, coming down to the final seconds, it can't get any closer than this one. Now, you notice there were only five seconds left on the clock, but the cycle started, and so it will complete its 45-second run. There is a double whip for the top skater, Mr. Mean. Harold Jackson tries to get six, cannot. Behind him is Ralphie, who also gets two. They get two on the jump. That means that in the final seconds, it is at this moment a dead heat. Go for it, Ralphie! Ralphie trying to pass. So is Mr. Mean. Neither man can do it. Come Clock on, running come down. On, come on, Good defense on, by the rear right, blockers. Yeah, We're seconds on. away from a dead heat. Come on, get that point. Again, Mr. Mean go can't on, pass, Ralphie. but neither can Ralphie. Crowd drawing. Four seconds, three, two, and nobody's going to pass, and we are going to Bring finish this gator. championship Bring game. the Gators. Going into sudden death, Chuck. Tied at 80. Unbelievable! It could be devastating! 80 to 80! Chuck, it's unbelievable down here. Look at those gators. There are four of them in the pits. There are three seven-footers and one big ten-footer known as Roller Gator. There he is right there. Look at those teeth. Both teams have been cleared to the outside of the track. They are lining the rail, cheering on their designated gator skaters. And here we go in sudden death. Each skater wearing the ceremonial sudden death hood. We don't know how they're going to play it, but they're now showing us that rather than win the lap, they're going to try to wrestle each other over that rail and into the pit. On the first lap, neither seems to be getting any leverage, so no, they'll clear out and try a second lap. T-Bird twins looking on. And again, as they approach the pit, the wrestling begins. Down goes the T-Bird gator skater. Now the, now the violator's got him by the shirt. He's got him up to the rail. He's pulling him up. Oh, the T-Bird winner! T-Bird skater, I believe that these violators have cheated. But they have won in sudden death overtime. Come on, get out of there, buddy. A victory lap for the violator, a roll over the top, apparently uninjured for the T-Bird gator skater. The commissioner's cup goes to the team in black. By the way, the white jammer you saw, that was him. <laughs> so Ralph Valderes, you might want to look him up on the internet because he's, he's pretty legendary in roller derby. He started skating roller derby in 1959, uh, I think, and he stopped skating in 1993. Wow. So he skated across five decades. So yeah, that was absurd. But these guys could still skate, and that's kind of one of the underappreciated things about this form of roller derby. I mean, there's like, it's like the WWE. Yeah, it's all scripted, yeah, it's all fake, but they're still athletes. Yeah. 
and these guys are still skaters. It's just that this was the only thing that they could do. It's the only thing available. So they did, and they did it for a really long time. So, believe it or not, there were rules to this thing. Mm. <laughs> you know what? There's really no point in showing you the rules, because the main idea, the one, the one rule, this thing was all about money. Making money. It was syndicated television. <laughs> and the show was just one platform. You know, it made pretty good money in syndication. But there was the merchandise. Merchandising, merchandising, merchandising. Where the real money from the TV show was made. Roller Games, the lunchbox. Roller Games, the magazine. Roller Games, the pinball machine. Roller Games, the, uh, the video games. And yes, Roller Games, the flamethrower. <laughs> Kids love that one. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, even though <laughs> this, this thing was ridiculous, like it had the, the figure eight track, the alligator pit, which was only used in sudden death over time, <laughs> the jump, you got points for going, like, that, that wall actually is no joke, because it's tall as a house. So you actually needed like a double whip to get up that thing properly. And you got six points if you got all the way to the top, wow. and two points if you got halfway up it. And if you jump 12 feet, you got six points. So, I mean, there were some pretty interesting things happening in the show as far as that goes. But as far as fake derby goes, this thing goes so far beyond the ridiculous, it loops back around to completely freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Did they ever have full episodes posted anywhere? Yeah, I have a couple of them. I have one on my YouTube channel. I'm still trying to get up. Yeah. <laughs> but. I wish. Yeah, but they, 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 they didn't get through one season of this show, though, because one of the distributors went bankrupt. So there's only like 11 or 12 episodes, I think, and they're really kind of hard to find. Some people have the DVDs, but they're not too open about trying to whatever. But anyways, I showed you this absurdness, because despite it not being anything resembling roller derby, it actually still resembles roller derby, because it is based off of roller derby. And the fundamentals of roller derby are that just that, the fundamentals. They're the things that are so basic, that are so core to the game. They have to be in there for any of this to make any sort of sense in whatever context whatsoever. And believe it or not, there are four things this thing has in common with roller derby. And here are three of them. Now, lead jammer, always got to be the jammer in the lead. And of course, the jammer laps opponents for points. And the jammer can always end the jam early. And in fact, in roller games, how they ended the jam is they tap their helmet. Which, if you think about it, that's kind of what jammers do. I always found that made more sense, because you can see your hands up here. Anyways. But these three basic things of the four I'm going to talk about, well, these are just part of the whole overall roller derby, well, the game of roller derby, really. All this stuff we've been talking about, uh, you know, offensive defense all the time, not just some of the time, the defense blocks to make a pack, uh, the fact that the defense can actually speed the pack forward a little bit to play defense, uh, consequences for inaction or not helping your jammer, all past and present form of roller derby have this stuff in there. Even renegade roller derby, which is the no penalty form of roller derby. I went to a renegade game a couple weeks ago. It was awesome. I was actually really surprised how much actually roller derby there was in there besides all the shoving and, and such. But you notice there's, there's something missing here, because all this stuff that's in all this roller derby doesn't all appear in WUFTA. As we see. <laughs> now, whenever you think of WFTDA, I mean, yeah, you get to lap people for points, but nothing else happens a lot of the time. I mean, we all know about the sausage or the passive offense or whatnot. I mean, and I mean, passive offense, we all don't like passive offense, right? Mm -hmm. and, but it's only ble bleedingly obvious that it happens during a power jam, because it also happens on regular jams. In either case, that red, those red blockers, they don't want to help their jammer, right? You know, nobody notices this because everybody's working hard, working as a team, nice strong wall, but it, you might as well call them team oil and team water. They just don't mix. 
and it's compared to however it's always been done, it's, it's not anywhere near as competitive or as exciting or as, frankly, fun as it should be to watch. I mean, roller derby has always been designed as something exciting all the time. And it boils down to this. This is pretty much how the jams start in Wifta nowadays. Jammers in the back, one wall of one team, one wall of the other team. But this, even this, violates one of the most core functions, the core thing about roller derby. And it's this, called the fair and equal jam start. Now, remember that roller derby originated as a race. I mean, that's why it's called roller derby. Derby means race. And like any race, to get to a goal, it only makes sense if both teams or any individuals in a race start the race at the same starting point. So you see, in um, Leo Celso's roller derby, they were required to line up mostly alternating, so blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, in order for a jam to start. And if you think about it, that's the only way it could work. Because if there were like three blue jammers at the front of the pack, you know, one could go and two could play defense without the red team ever having a fair chance to do the same to the blue team. And again, this is what shows up in Jerry Seltzer's roller derby. You put the pivots pretty much equal at the beginning of each other, you mix up the blockers and you mix up the jammers in the back. So whatever happens, both teams start at the same point. And whatever point they finish at, you know, they both have the same chance to get there, just whoever manages to work. And here are a couple other rule sets that abide by this principle. Uh, made roller derby, they have just one start line. All that requires that the pivots line up at the front. But as far as everybody else kind of mixing up here, that's actually mandated as far as what their strategy is. Because you need, again, blockers in the back to handle the jammers, blockers at the front to assist or cover the pivots. So it doesn't make any sense to wall them up. Not that either team would want to do that to begin with, because that's kind of how the game works. And even in Renegade, I was really surprised. They kind of did the same thing, even though they don't have pivots. Just the fact that you could like kind of legally cut around somebody. <laughs> like in, in Renegade, the boundary lines are literally suggestions. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but still, there's strategy to it, because that means they can just cut right around a wall. So walls don't work. You need to kind of spread yourself out to account for all the crazy crap that can happen. Japan. Again, there are no walls here. They're all spread out vertically. The only difference here is, is to compensate for the fact that there's only one jammer on the track. So you give the defense the first shot at the jammer, and you give them the first shot at getting away. It's all on the offense to score as many points as you can. But still, they all have to line up in this box before a jam can start. Inside, outside. No walls. Radical, RDCL, and USARs. Now, a lot of people suggested, hey, let's put the blockers in a start box so we can get them away from the jammers, so we can actually have some action happening. They tried this, but they ran into problems, both of them. In Radical, because it's a required forward motion rule, whatever team got to the back, they stayed there. And it was totally, completely possible, as it is in Wufta, for a, team, a team's jammer to get through the pack without any blockers touching the other blockers, which is totally unfair. And in USARS, they had the opposite problem. If a team started at the front, they just, whoosh, they got to the front immediately, and since they were the pack, they could just speed it up or slow it all down, and that didn't really give the red team, in this case, a fair chance to do the same thing. So interestingly, even though big track, flat track, uh, you know, a little bit faster, a little bit middle, different rule sets, different everything, they somehow arrived at the same solution, the exact same solution. Put your pivots at the front in a separate area, put your blockers in a box. Hmm, seeing a pattern here. There. And interestingly, when the WFTDA kind of started doing everything, they followed the exact same pattern. Pivots, blockers spread out, jammers. But somehow along the way, they kind of lost that. And 
you gotta wonder why. There are probably two things going on here. Now, actually, let me go back. Because when Roller Derby was originally starting, like new roller, modern roller derby, people kind of remembered, okay, we have to have the pivots at the front. Kind of remembered, okay, I remember pivots sometimes coming a jammer, so I guess you have to pass the star off. And I remember, okay, they, I guess they lined up equally, I guess that makes sense, we'll put it in the rules like that. But throughout the years, they lost sight of what the game of roller derby actually is. They're just rules, 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 rules. That's why the rule book is so bloody complicated, because they're trying to describe a game they don't fully understand. <laughs> and when something weird happens in the rules, they apply a fix based on the rules, not based on the game. Which is why, if you remember, kind of like uh, 2006, 2007, the whole runaway pussy situation, if some of you are familiar with that, basically that's USAR's pack definition. Instead of saying, hey, we need to get better at playing defense. Hey, we need better strategy to keep the other team behind us. They went, no, we need to change the rules. So they can't go away. And that's why we've been seeing non-jams and sausages and general frustration. So it's not about changing the rules. It's about knowing what the game is and then applying that knowledge in the game to the rules. So if we know there's a fair and equal jam start, but they want to line up like this, well, just force them to do that. And you see all of a sudden, now neither team has an immediate advantage. Neither team is at an immediate disadvantage. And if either team wants the luxury of having a nice back solid four wall against the jammer and having lead jammer, well, this forces them to go through the other team to earn that. There is no, okay, we got defense, oh, we can make the jammer go behind us. All those other blockers are going to totally ignore us as we recycle back. No, 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 none of that. This is a team game. It's a team sport. And the whole idea of rules are to force the teams to engage each other or else. And there's really none of the engagement, and worse, there's no or else in WUFTA right now. Compared to what Roller Derby's always been, compared to what it needs to be going forward, that needs to change. Because even if fake ass, alligator pit, wall of death, <laughs> jump, figure eight track, can force their blockers to line up equally, there's really no excuse for them not to do that. Because that's roller derby. That's sports. As all the modern rule sets kind of start trying to figure things out, instead of thinking forward, thinking about the future, thinking about what roller derby is going to be like going forward, they need to go back to what roller derby has always been. Use that as the base. Use that as the starting point. This is what roller derby is. This is the game we want to play. And then once that consensus has been reached or agreed upon, then you make the rules. You don't just kind of put the rules on autopilot and then come back into the rules and it's like feedback in a stereo system. It just makes noise. 53 pages of noise. <laughs> in conclusion, if you've never seen Roller Derby and played in other rule sets, check them out. Go to the USARS rules game tomorrow. I mean, Murda's the same rules, but they play it differently. They actually play offense in the pack. Imagine that. I know. Hard to believe. Bank track game, Derby Dolls, they stream all their games online. Well, most of their games online. Check it out. May, they're having their first national championship in Philadelphia. They're probably going to stream that too, I believe. Even Roller Game Japan, they stream their games. Uh, their next one's in September. I definitely recommend you check that out. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's but they play Roller Derby. All these people play Roller Derby. It's just that some of them kind of know where they're going with it. And everyone, I know everyone hopes that WIFTA does it too. They just need to, you know, <laughs> figure out what game they want to play and take from there. So that's it, everybody. Done. Thanks so much for coming out. Thank you. <laughs>